my friend. Let us get started because we have the great good fortune today to have John Bellinger with us. Uh, he runs the international law practice at Arnold and Porter. He uh, served as the National Security Advisor's legal counsel in the first Bush administration and as the Secretary of State's legal counsel in the second Bush administration. He has been a clarion voice on national security and law issues. Um, and he also organized the uh, opposition to President Trump uh, at, when he was a candidate for president, the Never Trump Letters. He uh, was, we were colleagues on the NSC, he in a much more exalted position than my little self, but he was notable during that time um, for his principled uh, and uh, tireless efforts to bring the Guantanamo prison issue into alignment with American um, principles and legal practices. He is a genuinely great American and it is a privilege for the International Institute for Strategic Studies to welcome him to our fellowship. Wow. I, I don't think I've ever had an introduction like that, Corey. I think I really better just quit now because it's all going to be downhill. Uh, anyway, it's wonderful to be back. Um, I, uh, I don't know how many of you all are regulars here at the IISS. I know there are council members here, but if you haven't been here before, I hope you know just how privileged you are to have my friend Corey Shockey here. Uh, this is a great export from the United <laughs> States, uh, and uh, uh, we, are, we are really privileged to uh, lend her to you. I, as you heard, I, uh, I worked with Corey when she was on the NSC staff on the first term. She was uh, uh, one of Secretary Rice's favorites uh, uh, in the Defense Directorate, uh, also then came back to us to Team Rice. Uh, at the State Department where she was deputy director of the policy planning staff where you know we're really the smarties. Uh, uh, and it was great to have her. So it's, it's wonderful to have you over here. Uh, nice to be back here um, at IISS. Um, I've been out now for uh, nine years out of government. In the time that I was legal advisor, I actually spent quite a bit of time in London, in fact, as Corey said, trying to engage in dialogue uh, with our European partners on international law issues. Uh, gave quite a few talks at the time. So um, here I want to uh, be fairly brief so we can engage in conversation. Um, my purpose today is mostly to try to talk about things that haven't happened yet. And I, I do pause, haven't happened yet, uh, mm -hmm. rather than just reviewing all the things that have happened. Um, uh, the, of course, you all uh, know well, it has been 16 months of uh, chaos and controversy, uh, both in policy uh, and in appointments, uh, you know, from the very first day of the uh, travel ban to the TPP withdrawal to the uh, Paris withdrawal to most recently the Iran withdrawal and uh, the Jerusalem embassy, uh, threats of uh, fire and fury on the North Koreans. Uh, and then just the uh, constant revolving door of hirings and firings uh, in Washington. I don't know how many of you read uh, the tweets on a regular basis, but it just, it just really are uh, 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 shocking for those of us who have served on the NSC staff. Um, I, let me just say a, a word about appointments right now, uh, because it is an interesting time, and then get into the couple of areas that I want to talk about going forward. Um, the last, uh, so Corey and I have both served at state and on the NSC staff, uh, and it will be interesting to see what is going to happen now going forward now that we have new leadership at both state and at the NSC. I, I think I am more sanguine about the State Department, uh, although the jury is out, but I mean, as, as you know, being a, 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 a well-read audience, there's some hope that with, uh, with Secretary Pompeo, whatever his policy views on issues, uh, that he will at least get the State Department staffed up. Uh, it's amazing how few positions have been filled. Virtually none of the undersecretary positions and assistant secretary positions have been filled after, uh, after 16 months. I think there is only one 
geographic assistant secretary position uh, uh, for, uh, for Europe is the only one, and that person actually did not have any government experience before, although I think he's well regarded, but uh, the department really has been leaderless, and Tom Shannon just had his retirement uh, ceremony yesterday, so we're actually losing the uh, undersecretary for policy. So the question is, will the State Department actually get staffed up? I do know, uh, because I've been working with some of the people who are doing the staffing, that, that Secretary Pompeo is going to try very hard there. The NSC staff, on the, other, on the other hand, we're now on reboot number three, uh, from Flynn to McMaster to John Bolton. Corey and I both worked with John Bolton. Uh, John came in uh, and basically cleaned house at the NSC. Again, you all know very well, this is where everybody normally wants to go. Corey and I were really privileged to serve there. I had come from the Justice Department. She had come from the State Department. Most of the people on the NSC staff are supposed to, are, have been detailed from the departments or have government experience. You know, it's well known, of course, that Condi Rice had been you know, previously on President Bush 41's NSC staff. But right now, no one really wants to serve on the NSC staff. So it's made it very difficult for the president uh, to get people. It's uh, For the last year, it's been mostly military detailees, people who really are willing to just sort of salute um, and, and take these jobs. And it's been good that they've been there. These are solid people, uh, but these are not, frankly, uh, the, 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 the creative uh, uh, talents that we've had historically. So we'll see who John Bolton will bring in, uh, but it will be hard, I think, for him to, 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 to bring on a strong NSC staff. So let me get to, um, I'm going to really briefly go through a couple of areas of, and as I say, some of these have begun to happen, some of them haven't happened yet, so these are basically issues to watch. So first, counterterrorism policies. Of course, you know, both President Bush and then somewhat surprisingly President Obama became famous for their counterterrorism policies, President Bush for sort of the things he did, and President Obama for the things that he continued that people thought that he was going to stop. Uh, so uh, here, I guess, the one-line message is that there's been more continuity than change under President Trump. Um, you know, he has not returned to uh, uh, waterboarding people. He has not, uh, despite threatening to do so, opened uh, up, up Guantanamo. Um, uh, there's been more really sound uh, and fury than actual change. And so the question is, will that end up changing? Um, I think perhaps the reason for this is that it's, uh, uh, it's not as much of a domestic issue for him uh, to, uh, to do that much more in the counterterrorism area. So, you know, what has he done? He, he certainly he has ramped up drone strikes, uh, which President Obama had been ramping down. He's been ramping them up. It's not actually been very well covered in the press, and be actually worth people having more of a look at uh, because there there really have been more drone strikes, uh, and it's just not been watched very much. Um, he had a very early policy review. It was one of his first national security memoranda uh, that ordered a review of counterterrorism policies to determine whether the policies went beyond what international law required. In other words, was President Obama restricting counterterrorism policies, sort of keeping the gloves on uh, more than was necessary? Uh, the results of that review are not public, but the press reports suggest that uh, that there really hasn't been much change. So, for example, in the drone strike area, uh, President Obama had, as a matter of policy, said that at least in areas outside active combat operations, the United States could only take drone strikes uh, if there was a near certainty of no civilian casualties, a very high standard, as you in the military know. People expected President uh, Trump would probably drop that, but I think on probably the recommendation of the military, uh, he did not. So he's kept on some of these uh, some of these restrictions. We'll see if some of that changes. I uh, I do think that the under the Trump administration that there has been more aggressive counterterrorism policies, uh, resulting in more civilian casualties. There was just a report out last week that some of you may have seen that suggested that civilian casualties are increasing, but not not an enormous amount of change. Uh, the, earlier this year, of course, the president at the time the State of the Union uh, famously said that he was going to uh, uh, reopen Guantanamo. Um, 
that I don't think that's really going to happen. That was more of a publicity stunt. Uh, to a certain extent, it was really the, the yin to the yang of President Obama saying that he was going to close Guantanamo. All Trump did really was to strike out one line in the uh, Obama executive order uh, that had ordered Guantanamo closed, and he just struck that. And then he ordered a review by the Defense Department uh, about uh, the need to keep Guantanamo open. Um, I would be quite surprised uh, if, uh, if the administration starts sending more people uh, to Guantanamo, because I think the Defense Department's opposed to it, the Justice Department's opposed to it, the State Department is opposed to it. It just causes huge litigation challenges. Um, as you know, here uh, in London, there is this uh, uh, arm wrestling over these new ISIS uh, uh, the Beatles as to whether they would be extradited. Well, it wouldn't be actually be a matter of extradition they would, since they're, they're in, I think, Iraq or Syria, whether they would be sent to the United States for trial. And if so, would they go to Guantanamo or would they go to federal court? Um, uh, I've been publicly saying that yeah, I think they ought to just be sent to federal court where they can be prosecuted probably fairly uh, rapidly. But the point is, we've not seen that much change in US counterterrorism policy yet. So sort of watch to see what happens. Let me turn to use of force more generally. Um, here we have not seen any sort of consistent strategy uh, or, 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 or overall policy on use of force. There's been uh, uh, a lot of statements and uh, from President Trump uh, that seem to be sort of unguided by any overall strategy. Of course, he's uh, used force against Syria twice, and he has threatened fire and fury on the North Koreans, but it doesn't seem to be part of any either overall policy uh, towards the use of force, and he, he certainly doesn't seem to be guided by international law principles on, uh, on use of force. Um, you know, it was while unpopular, uh, you know, the Bush administration had its preemption doctrine, which actually, after much criticism, was then adopted by the Obama administration, saying that we will, in fact, uh, act uh, to uh, address threats uh, 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 before they occur, at least in the counterterrorism context. The uh, Trump administration's national security strategy really didn't lay that out what its use of force policy was going to be. Um, on Syria, the uh, administration has made uh, uh, really no effort to uh, justify the two Syria strikes uh, uh, under international law. Of course, frankly, it would be hard to do so. For those of you who know your international law, there's the, uh, it was not an action in self-defense. Uh, it was not authorized by the Security Council, and there was not consent of Syria, so you really couldn't authorize, you couldn't say that it was authorized under international law. Uh, uh, interestingly, though, you did see, uh, if you read carefully, uh, in the second strike uh, uh, six weeks ago that was coordinated with the British and the French, there did seem to be an effort by Nikki Haley to align the U.S. justification with the Europeans, in other words, recognizing a need to speak in the, at least the language of international law. She said that these strikes are lawful, legitimate, and proportional. Now, just because she says that they are doesn't necessarily make them so, but it, 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 it was clear that the US was trying at least to talk in the language of, uh, of, of international law, uh, that there were factors that were justifying those strikes. So um, uh, with North Korea, uh, again, the, the, the uh, President Trump and the administration have not uh, been clear, this was at the time he was threatening to use force before the, uh, the summit now, he had not made clear how any s strike on North Korea would be, uh, would be lawful. I actually wouldn't testify before the Senate back in December because the Senate Foreign Relations Committee was getting concerned that the President really was getting ready for some sort of a preemptive attack on North Korea to we had a discussion on what the, the legal principles would be. Um, but overall, the point is on use of force, the uh, president's already used force twice. He has not been clear what the justification was. He has threatened the use of force against North Korea and has not explained the justification. So uh, it's, uh, there doesn't seem to be a sort of a coherent uh, strategy or policy on the use of force. So we'll sort of watch to see what happens. Um, let me now turn to treaties and international organizations. My 
Corey's and my uh, uh, former colleague Richard Haas has famously said that here we really do have a, a strategy. It's called the withdrawal doctrine. Uh, you know, the, the Trump administration has, and President Trump personally, has withdrawn, obviously, from TPP, from Paris, from the Iran deal. You recall he also withdrew from UNESCO. Uh, 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 and so the question is, what more may he withdraw from? So I want to end my last uh, few minutes on talking about some things that haven't happened yet. And the question is, will they happen or not? Um, so one, um, Human, Human Rights Council. Actually, interesting, uh, since that's been a favorite whipping boy for uh, this administration. And really, both Republican and Democratic administrations have been concerned about the Human Rights Council. It's been surprising that there's been no action there. Uh, 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 second, more generally, uh, treaties. Um, you may recall, this worried me in particular as former State Department legal advisor, that there was a leaked executive order in January of 2017. It was never signed, I think, because it got leaked. But it was a draft executive order that came out of the White House that would have created a high-level review to review all treaties and international organizations to which the US was a party or a member to determine which ones we should withdraw from. And interestingly, the preamble to this executive order uh, cited uh, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, and the Rights of the Child Convention, both favorite whipping boys of conservatives. Problem is, the United States is not party to either one of those. <laughs> so it was sort of interesting. It, 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 the psyche here is that there, that previous administrations had been signing the United States up to various multilateral uh, treaties or into international institutions, and that there needed to be a review by the Trump administration uh, to get out of them. Uh, so, you know, obviously, he has withdrawn from some of these more famous ones. But you know, are there more treaties that he is now going to try to withdraw from? Um, here are a couple of interesting statistics for you. Um, the, the Bush administration, who you know was not well known for its support of international law, actually, during the eight years of the Bush administration, the United States joined 163 treaties more treaties during an eight-year presidency than at any point in American history. 163 treaties. Uh, the, now, candidly, the reason we could get to part of that was that we redid our uh, mutual legal assistance and extradition treaties with the EU. So that was 27 <laughs> times 2. That got us to 54. <laughs> but still, that gave you another 90. And there were multilateral uh, there were arms control treaties, human rights treaties, uh, uh, protocol to the Geneva Conventions, environmental treaties, a lot of new stuff. Every one of these had to go across President Bush's desk to be transmitted to the Senate and then ratified by the President. So more new treaty law during the Bush administration wow. than under any previous presidents. Under President Obama, only 20 treaties, 20 treaties during the, the similar period of time. Now, part of that is that, frankly, we had cleared away so many during the Bush administration that there just were not as many out there. The Senate had turned more conservative, and so they were slowing down. In the last year and a half, President Trump has transmitted no new treaties to the Senate, no new treaties transmitted to the Senate. And the Senate has only approved one treaty. That was the Montenegro uh, uh, accession to NATO. So the United States is really slowing down in uh, uh, negotiating and joining treaties. So watch, you know, will we actually start seeing, rather than more treaties being joined, will, is, is there, in fact, uh, consistent with the executive order a year ago, or will the president start withdrawing from more treaties? That is something that worries me. Last two points, International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court. Uh, the, so here are two things that you may not be watching and do, do watch. One, uh, the United States right now is litigating a case against Iran before the ICJ. Anybody been watching this at all? Iran has sued the United States uh, before the International Court of Justice for seizing its central bank assets to pay a terrorism judgment a couple of years ago. Uh, that, the, 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 the case in the United States went all the way up to our Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said 
that the United States could seize Iran's central bank assets, which are sovereign assets, to pay the, a judgment in favor of some terrorism victims. Uh, Iran then promptly turned around and sued the United States before the International Court of Justice back under the Obama administration under a treaty provision, which I was actually surprised to find that we were still party to, the, <laughs> the, the Treaty of Amity between the United States and Iran. Uh, apparently, we have remained party to the Treaty of Amity because hope springs eternal that Amity <laughs> will return. Anyway, that has a dispute resolution provision. Iran sued us. Um, it's been quietly litigated. Um, we are arguing that the court does not have jurisdiction under this Treaty of Amity. Here's the point, though. For those of you who are, uh, uh, remember the Reagan administration, you remember the United States withdrew from the a case before the ICJ, the Nicaragua case before the ICJ, which really damaged the reputation of the United States in international law circles. So the question is, will the United States withdraw from this case before the International Court of Justice, particularly if we lose on jurisdiction, where the, uh, if the court decides that it does have jurisdiction to hear this case, will the Trump administration simply say, we're quitting, we're out of here? And this is frankly where John Bolton comes in. John, uh, and I was John's lawyer, Corey was John's colleague, uh, uh, we both worked with him. I mean, John is not a fan of international law and international institutions. So if it gets to the point where the International Court of Justice is saying, we are going to hear this case, uh, which is in the preliminary phases, will the Trump administration simply decide to withdraw? Uh, that's something that could happen later on this year or next year. Um, finally, um, uh, and this has a John Bolton connection, International Criminal Court. Uh, uh, will the U.S. Uh, 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 essentially declare a new war on the International Criminal Court? Just to remind you of this arc of history, uh, the United States was uh, heavily involved in negotiating the Rome Statute, which created the International Criminal Court. They didn't like the treaty that uh, emerged, so President Clinton, despite having been involved in negotiating it, voted against it, uh, only one of seven countries to do so. Uh, at the end, he ultimately signed the treaty, but said he wasn't going to send it forward to the Senate unless it were fixed. As you recall, in the first couple of years of the Bush administration, when John Bolton was undersecretary, the United States famously unsigned the Rome Statute. Now, you can't unsign a treaty, but what the United States did was to notify the Secretary General that the United States uh, uh, did not ever plan to become party to the Rome Statute. John Bolton personally signed that letter to the Secretary General of the UN and has said, this is much quoted, that it, it was his happiest day at the State Department to send this letter unsigning the Rome Statute. Uh, uh, the United States then embarked on an effort it, mandated by Congress, and this is important, to negotiate agreements, so-called non-surrender agreements, or for those of you who know the details, Article 98 agreements uh, with different countries to get those countries to promise not to turn over Americans uh, to the International Criminal Court. And the John Bolton, when he was undersecretary, uh, led those efforts to uh, uh, convince something like 100 countries in the world uh, to enter into these non-surrender agreements. It was, as you recall, very unpopular at the time. It looked like the United States was trying to throttle the ICC in its infancy uh, uh, and got a lot of criticism. Um, and Secretary Rice and I then moved over to the State Department in the second term, and we recalibrated our policy towards the ICC. Uh, and with the point being that we needed to have essentially a peaceful coexistence, that the court was, when the court was doing work that we supported, that we would support the court. If the court was attacking us, though, uh, then we would not support it. And one of the first things that happened in 2005 was the referral of the Sudan genocide to the court, which the United States did not block. We abstained on that. In fact, we ultimately said we would support the court in its investigation. So throughout the second term of the Bush administration, we entered really into a, a policy of sort of, we reoriented our policy from the John Bolton days of 2002 to 2004 to a policy of sort of peaceful coexistence and support for the court. 
The Obama administration pretty much continued that, a little bit more warmly, but not a lot more. So the question is, will we now revert back to this hostile period? Uh, now, the problem is, is that the court now is uh, uh, provoking its own confrontation with the United States. The prosecutor uh, has asked the court judges to approve an investigation of the United States for its activities in Afghanistan and also for uh, the CIA detention program. Uh, the, the, we are waiting for a decision from the court whether they will authorize opening that investigation if the court opens an investigation of the United States, uh, the United States government will have to react. Uh, and with John Bolton as national security advisor, the person who had really been the architect of the war on the court in 2002 to 2004, will this mean that we will really go back to uh, this incredibly hostile period of 2002 to 2004? Uh, I personally hope there can be some way to avoid this. Uh, I, I, it would not make a lot of sense for the court to provoke this fight, but they may have actually boxed themselves into a corner where they can't do anything. If the, if the Trump administration goes and declares war on the court, though, uh, it could get to be very messy. The United States will, could go back to trying to press allies not to support the court, it will go back to trying to undermine the court. It will, the court may be asking Britain or other countries to help the investigation of the United States. That would put our allies into a difficult position. Uh, so this is another thing to watch. Um, it's we are waiting for a decision <clears throat> from the court whether to open this investigation. And there would then be some sort of a reaction from the United States. I personally think this is something uh, where it is a train wreck coming but it is avoidable through diplomacy. And the question is, is that diplomacy going to be there? So those are a couple of things to watch. Uh, uh, withdrawal from more organizations, withdrawal from treaties, uh, withdrawal from the case before the ICJ, uh, a redeclaration of war on the ICC. Uh, these are things that could come, and we will have to see uh, what happens. Um, to end on a possibly positive note, uh, 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 the lawyers uh, who ha are being appointed to different positions in the Bush administration are actually pretty solid people, including the new legal advisor at the State Department, um, is actually the first woman ever to serve as legal advisor. It's amazing that it has taken that long in the 150 years of the office. But there's a very good woman who had served in the Bush administration, real centrist, who is legal advisor. And there are good lawyers, almost all of whom served in the Bush administration, who have good, solid experience uh, uh, in the uh, either uh, have already been confirmed or have been nominated at defense, at state, at treasury, at justice, at CIA. And the question is, will they actually be able to uh, contain some of these actions? Um, you know, I don't think President, there was a period of time where people thought, well, maybe President Trump would settle down, he would listen to his advisors, you know, sort of like President Bush, who, you know, really did moderate a lot in his second term. Uh, I don't actually see that happening with President Trump. And so the question is, you know, will... Uh, will there be a clash between him and his advisors and between some of these lawyers who might be advising on these issues? So um, to answer the question, uh, you know, will it get better or worse? I think there is a lot of potential for it to get worse because of these issues, uh, and, uh, but, but really too soon to tell uh, what will happen on each of these. But I, I have to say I'm, I am happy to see uh, some good people in office, uh, but I'm not terribly optimistic about some of the decisions that, uh, that the president may take. So I'll end there. Thank you, John. That was a fantastic education. I was taking notes wildly because there was, there's actually a lot of this I didn't know. Uh, so thank you for that education, my friend. Can I ask whether there are any interesting legal issues associated with the withdrawal from the Iran agreement? either legal issues um, as concerns our allies, as opens opportunities for the Iranians, or um, legal issues that may arise about application of secondary sanctions mm. on companies that are going, European companies in particular, but also uh, other companies. 
non-American companies, given that uh, the acknowledgement is widespread, including on the part of the American government, that Iran remains in compliance with the provisions? Yeah, great question. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with the sanctions issue, because I think that's, um, you know, obviously, the U.S. sanctions are being, um, uh, the, the, the U.S. Uh, 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 unilateral statutory sanctions will all go back on uh, uh, after a 90 or 180 day period of time. Uh, that will mean uh, since U.S. companies other than Boeing uh, whose deal is now dead, uh, there really wasn't that much for U.S. companies but the, the bigger issue will be as will the secondary sanctions uh, uh, really have an effect on the activities of other countries. Uh, uh, I'm getting personally in my private law firm uh, uh, capacity lots of questions from Asian companies in particular who had been going back into Iran and now are worried that they're going to get sanctioned. Uh, so you know the possibility of U.S. sanctions is really uh, a lot. Um, how effective will they be, though, uh, if they are not multilateral? If the uh, if Europe. Uh, and Japan and other countries don't join the United States, which looks like is not likely to happen, despite I'm sure browbeating from the United States, then we're going to have uh, 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 non-U.S. companies subject to U.S. sanctions, but not subject to Japanese or Korean or uh, or European sanctions, uh, and and these companies will get whipsawed. It will pit ad, uh, uh, allies against allies. And I don't think that it will end up putting the pressure on the Iranians that we'd expected. Um, the last thing, which is, I, I guess I would say, something also worth watching, um, and again, maybe with John Bolton at the helm, um, you know, the U.S. has returned by not waiving anymore the U.S. Uh, uh, unilateral sanctions. But you'll recall that the Iran deal also provided for snapback of the multilateral UN sanctions. And this was very cleverly done as a legal matter. I have to say it's actually brilliant. Uh, uh, is the US could snap back on multi all multilateral sanctions by the UN by itself. It does not require action of other countries. Uh, if the U.S. files a report with the Security Council that Iran is in violation uh, of the uh, Iran deal, then the, the Security Council considers the matter, uh, but unless the Security Council votes not to return the sanctions, which of course the U.S. could veto, the sanctions will automatically return. So the question is, could the Trump administration, uh, and John Bolton, of course, had been UN ambassador. He's a very good lawyer. He is a master of uh, UN procedure. Um, to trigger that, though, the, uh, the US would have to say that, the, that Iran is not in uh, compliance. Now, of course, they can say that if they want, uh, but we'd have to see what happens. So I think that would be one thing to watch, would be does the US try to go even farther now uh, I guess I would really call that sort of the nuclear option to try to unilaterally re-trigger uh, UN sanctions. Wow, I had not realized that was in the offing. So my friends, you see what an extraordinary legal mind and policy mind you have in front of you in the, in the person of John Bellinger. I will start taking questions. Please tell him your name and where you work. First one on the aisle here. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm Shao from Chinese Embassy. Uh, I used to work in Washington D.C. At the, during the Bush administration. Ah, good. Sorry. It's nice to see you again. See you yep. Uh, I've got a question which uh, you touch upon, uh, like the uh, North Koreans. New, the, uh, next next week there will be a meeting in Singapore. So I wish to know uh, how do you think uh, is it possible to turn the, the troops? Uh, into like an uh, agreement or treaty to end the war, uh, what, what kind of difficulties involved. And secondly, talk, you talk, mentioned about the strikes against uh, Syria. Uh, do you think there are strong arguments for humanitarian intervention in using these strikes? And lastly, <laughs> just over the weekend, in the Shangri-La dialogue, uh, people talk a lot about the 
freedom of navigation, the enclaves, etc. I don't know whether the United States uh, are you are there any possibilities for it to become a party of enclaves, and if not, uh, do you see uh, okay. strong legal arguments? Yeah. For, for the, the Three course. excellent questions, oh. and although it is a violation <laughs> oh of the double I double S house rule to crowd everybody out that way, they are such interesting questions. I will let all three of them stand. I will try to give short answers. So I'm undercutting well. the rules-based order all oh, by boy. my little <laughs> self. Uh, I uh, I spent uh, eight years trying to get the United States uh, to uh, ratify the uh, Law of the Sea Treaty. I personally testified in favor a number of times. Unfortunately, our Senate has just been getting more and more and more conservative. So uh, 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 unlike uh, other sort of Nixon to China type things, I am not going to hold my breath that President Trump is going to uh, join the Law of the Sea Treaty. It's really... Uh, uh, unfairly criticized by conservatives, and I just don't think you would get it through the Senate. Uh, so that's that's unfortunate. But we do remain compliant with all of its provisions. We, we do, we do. Uh, that's the interesting part, is that the United States continues to comply so that most of it is in fact customary international law, uh, and the U.S. observes the law of the sea uh, treaty and its terms, even though our Senate has not approved it. Um, the uh, on uh, let me go back to your Korea question. Um, I I don't think we're going to see a lot coming out of this uh, summit. But you put your finger off. I understood your question on something interesting. Would the would there be a peace treaty out of the out of this, which would be uh, really a just a, a juridical end to the war that has ended uh, 60 some odd years ago. Um, uh, I think that actually might be a possibility uh, uh, because it would be something that would be uh, quite significant symbolically um, but without actually changing a lot and without the U.S. having to give up um, a whole lot. The U.S. would have to give up some things because by uh, virtue of the the war never being ended as a legal matter, there are certain legal authorities uh, that the United States has uh, continued uh, to use. So, if the if there's a peace treaty between North Korea and the United States that's announced, that could uh, end certain legal authorities. But I I could certainly see that as something that would be announced because it would be you know it would be a big announcement, but without a whole lot of significant uh, effect. Um, and what was your second question? Uh, the Humanitarian interference. Oh, right, humanitarian intervention. Uh, I'll quickly on that one, this is uh, the United States has never adopted the doctrine of humanitarian intervention that you can use force in a state for a purely humanitarian purpose. For those of you who have been following this, Britain has, starting back in Kosovo, and again with its own strikes on Syria, has said that those are justified by a doctrine of humanitarian intervention that they, Britain and two or three other countries, but certainly uh, a minority of countries believe that despite the fact that the UN Charter does not give a right to intervene in another country for a humanitarian purpose, uh, Britain, Denmark, one or two other countries have said that they believe that it's justified. The United States has never adopted that doctrine only because we worry that it would cause more harm than good. That if we said that we recognize a right of humanitarian intervention that that would be abused by other countries. So the United States when it has in fact intervened for humanitarian purposes as in Kosovo and in Syria, the United States has tended to argue the facts rather than the law. There's the old adage amongst lawyers that when the law is on your side, argue the law. If the law is not on your side, argue the facts. And the United <laughs> States has tended to argue more of the facts when it has engaged in humanitarian intervention. Britain has uh, preferred to argue the, to really try to uh, uh, recognize emerging law. Other questions? Yes, in the far back. Thank you. Um, it's nice to hear about your voice. That's <coughs> sense. Um, can you clarify? Your name and where you're from, please. Could you clarify for me the relationship between the U.S. and the ICJ? You mentioned a case pending there right now with Iran. The U.S. withdrew from compulsory uh, jurisdiction in '86. So what's left to further? 
to take further, so to speak? Quite a bit, actually. Uh, so the compulsory jurisdiction of the court, countries that are party to the ICJ can agree to what's called compulsory jurisdiction, where they agree that any dispute brought by any country can be brought against them before the ICJ. So that you can see that's sort of opening yourself up to things that you don't know are coming. Uh, what it, we've generally seen in the world is small countries have been willing to do that because, it, frankly, if you are a very tiny country, there are very few countries that are likely to sue you. If you were a really big country, most big countries have not agreed to compulsory jurisdiction because they don't know what might be coming from the right or the left or ever. So, but it leaves jurisdiction based on individual treaties. So the United States is party to many treaties that have a compulsory dispute re resolution mechanism where we have said uh, if there's a dispute, then we can go to the ICJ. So this treaty with Iran, this treaty of amity, uh, uh, the, actually Iran, one of the reasons I'm actually a little surprised we're still party to it is Iran has sued us before under the treaty of amity uh, uh, when we attacked their oil platforms in the Gulf after they were using their oil platforms to fire at our vessels. So uh, the, uh, in a case that your council member here from Mexico uh, was involved in, I actually litigated a case when Mexico sued us before the ICJ under the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations because the United States had not given consular notice to some Mexican nationals who ended up being convicted. So Mexico had sued us before the ICJ under that treaty. So yes, the, uh, to our friend from China, I actually just gave a lecture in China. You know, the United States has appeared before the ICJ in several dozen contested cases. We generally are open to the ICJ's jurisdiction as long as we've agreed. China has never, occur, have never appeared ever in a contested case before the ICJ. Does that not destroy those treaties of which that is a part? Sorry? Does that not destroy the treaties of which that uh, resolution uh, mechanism is a part? Destroy them in what way? Well, if, if the ICJ becomes the conflict resolution mechanism in these treaties and the U.S. withdraws from that, does it thereby not technically withdraw from those treaties? We have, in some cases, we actually have withdrawn from treaties where we uh, believed that the dispute resolution mechanism was being abused. So, for example, the Vienna Convention, uh, this is the convention where we all agree that we'll give consular notice to each other if any of us are arrested in each other's countries. Very important right. Um, there is a, a dispute resolution mechanism. When uh, Iran held our hostages in 1979, 80, uh, without giving, obviously giving anybody access to them, we sued Iran under the consular convention before the ICJ, and we won back in 1980. Uh, uh, the court ruled that Iran had violated the consular rights of our nationals. Um, when Mexico sued the United States, oh, though under the consular convention, we agreed to, to go through with the case, uh, and it was litigated. I defended the case before the ICJ. We did then, the Bush administration made the decision to withdraw after the case because they felt that uh, we would keep getting sued under the Vienna Convention if our state authorities forgot to give people their consular notice. So it was a two-edged sword. We lost the ability to sue other countries like Iran, but the decision was that we would keep getting sued. And so you know, we, we, the United States and other countries have occasionally withdrawn from treaties uh, if they believe that uh, they don't want to go to the, the ICJ. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I am from Iran. Ah, OK. I have worked in atomic energy organization. Very good before and after the revolution. I am retired now. And I'm against the policy of uh, my country, Iran, the Islamic Republic. My question is that uh, Iran has declared to European countries that if they can't help Iran to sell its oil and to help the industry of Iran, the commerce and industry, with, with, with those sanctions of the uh, United States, Iran will withdraw from nuclear deal. My question is that uh, what would be the reaction of the US? What would, you, give me the question one more time, what would the reaction of the US be if? Yeah, if Iran withdraws from nuclear deal. 
because now Iran is a nuclear deal, China, right, Russia, right, and right. the European countries. Right. But Iran has declared to the European countries that we cannot help. Right, right. Uh, I mean, I, I think the United States, it's hard to know what the thinking of the Trump administration is on, on the Iran deal, but I assume that they expect that Iran uh, might withdraw uh, if the U.S. withdrew. Uh, uh, the, you know, frankly, uh, you know, I don't know whether the U.S. is trying to encourage uh, uh, the three European countries to withdraw or not, but I do think that the U.S. is prepared for uh, Iran to withdraw. I have not seen uh, uh, the U.S. trying to encourage Iran to stay in. Uh, uh, or to threaten them if they pull out of the deal. Now, they have obviously made threats to Iran if they were to return to enrichment, but I have not seen uh, any effort to say that the United States is out of the deal, but that Iran should stay in the deal. In fact, as a policy matter, uh, I think the administration is hoping that Iran will withdraw from the deal because that at some level will make us less visible uh, for having withdrawn ourselves. And second, it will make easier the political case to allies and other potential investors in Iran that they should. The smartest thing the Iranians could do is remain in the deal and remain compliant because that makes much more difficult the politics of the U.S. getting other countries not to put sanctions back on. Nick Childs. Thank you, Corey. Nick Childs from the Institute. In, uh, in terms of things that haven't happened yet, as you talked about, uh, the INF Treaty. Um, yeah. You have the, uh, uh, the U.S. saying that the other part of the treaty is out of compliance and has breached the treaty now. At the same time, in the U.S., you have um, some leaders, particularly in, in PACOM, what we now have to call indo pacom saying that the INF Treaty is binding the hands of the United States mm. in terms of being able to um, respond to challenges by a non-member of the, the INF Treaty, China, in terms of its mm. weapons development. So, so just what your thoughts are on, A, what the likelihood is of a withdrawal there, and what particularly in terms of how you deal with the Russia issue, your advice would be on, on the argument. Yeah. Uh, so Corey's probably better on this one than I am because I've not been following it closely. I know it's an issue. I just don't know what the thinking is. Uh, I know there has been discontent uh, with the, uh, uh, by some in the U.S. government with the INF uh, Treaty, but I don't know whether it's on the chopping block or not. Uh, this could end up being something where there really is going to be a disagreement between uh, the State Department and the Defense Department uh, uh, and uh, that would ultimately have to be resolved at the highest levels of the White House. Do you want to offer anything on that? In a different Republican administration, yes. what you would have is uh, the long-suffering State Department legal advisor uh, having to try and craft a negotiation to bring other signatories into the INF in particular to try and get the Chinese to become a party to it so that you could continue to press the Russians on their non-compliance while managing the problem of our asymmetric vulnerability to Chinese missiles in those ranges. Um, and that would be a great negotiation to have because all sorts of political advantage would accrue to the United States with countries in Asia that we were trying so hard to limit this risk to those countries. Um, so it would be a really smart thing to do. But I think it unlikely the Trump administration will hit a grace note like that. See ref earlier, zero treaties submitted. Um, so, yes, sir. Uh, it's Masato Kimura, Japanese. Nice to see you. How are you? And a uh, member of WIWS. And uh, my, Yay! Question is, <laughs> my question is about data protection. Yeah. Uh, 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 general data protection regulation was launched in May. Uh, 
of European Union. And um, the US and uh, EU has a privacy shield or agreement. And how do you see the future so, of the shape of data protection uh, transatlantic? Uh, it's going to be, I think, a challenge between the United States to try to get used to U.S. data protection rights. I, all of us have been receiving these emails from every organization that uh, we belong to telling us that we uh, are going to uh, lose our emails if we don't click consent boxes. Um, uh, oh, as far as government to government, though, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know where things stand as far as the, the Trump administration. And I, I don't think that there really is a policy that I'm aware of to try to address the EU data protection. Uh, um, you know, one thing that seems to have blown over, maybe because it was a seemed like a, a big issue in the Obama administration. Uh, but it now uh, pales in comparison to everything else that's going on in this administration. So what's yesterday's news is uh, uh, you know, Euro European data protection against the United States and the uh, uh, protection from U.S. intelligence services. And as you recall, back in the Obama administration, there are efforts to really negotiate sort of no spying agreements and so forth. Uh, that all seems to have sort of fallen by the wayside, uh, that, that issue which was hot for a period of time after Snowden, um, all seems to have sort of gone away because there are bigger issues right now. So I'm, I'm not aware actually that the U.S. and the, the EU sort of government to government after the, uh, uh, the new data protection rules are really trying to negotiate something you as a government to government level, but I may be, I may be wrong. May I ask a quick follow-up yeah. on that? Um, as a matter of law, the EU, how, how concerned should the United <clears throat> States government be about the EU going after big American <coughs> Silicon Valley companies? Do we have a governmental dog in this fight? Um, because it seems to me that they are asymmetrically trying to apply European law, but that's exactly what we do on secondary sanctions. Right. So, so how do you thread that? So I think, I think that, I, I'm sure the answer is I don't know the answer to that. Uh, and part of this may be that with uh, not enough officials in the Trump administration to try to take these issues on as a governmental matter, that U.S. companies are concerned about this but don't have a champion in the United States. So, I mean, this is frankly where the so many Trump administration officials failed to understand the value of the State Department uh, in negotiating these agreements. So there's not, for example, 16 months in, and this is perplexing, a undersecretary for economic and business affairs. Um, this is one of six undersecretaries of the State Department. It's usually the one job that's one of the first to fill because there's, you don't often have to have a lot of government experience and that the, uh, to be undersecretary for policy, that job almost always goes to someone who's a governmental retread, someone who's done at it before. The undersecretary for economics and business is often a well-known American business uh, woman or man, uh, sometimes may have had government experience, but that would then be the principal negotiator for something like this. Um, but we just don't have these people, uh, you know, the, the people at the senior level in the Trump administration have been so focused on tariffs and trade policy that something like this, that where U.S. companies are rightly concerned, Corey, they don't really have a champion uh, to be engaged in these negotiations, uh, you know, as far as I've, as far as I've seen. I mean, the, certainly the State Department has got the regular career people. Uh, but there, there's not been a strong voice to, to push back uh, that I've seen. Our council member. Thank you. Uh, Andre Rosenthal from Mexico, a member of the Biden-less council. Yay! John, uh, <laughs> thank you for the presentation. Um, I don't envy your successor in the legal department, the State Department, legal office, State Department, legal advisor, uh, because at the end of the day today, International law is really very secondary in terms of policy 
by the U.S. administration. Uh, sovereignty and all the other discussions that have been going on. You didn't mention NAFTA. It's right. not a treaty. Yeah. So perhaps you. That's something that hasn't happened yet. Maybe you yeah, didn't right. mention for yeah. that reason, yeah. but it's certainly on the horizon um, with uh, recurrent threats by the president to withdraw from from NAFTA. Uh, how do you see the ongoing? relationship between the U.S. and international law. There's always been over the years a pick and choose system where the U.S. has chosen the things it wants to defend under international law and those that it doesn't. But today there's really none. And the institutions, treaties, everything is sort of being undermined, withdrawn from. How do you see the broader picture? of whether this is going to, da is this going to damage the United States going forward uh, in its relationship with the rest of the countries of the world? Uh, is it temporary or how do you see it? That, that's a great question and I am worried uh, because we don't have anyone in this administration, um, gosh I look across the, the all of the senior people uh, who, except for Secretary Mattis, who really are going to be concerned about a rules-based system and about international law. And uh, and Corey's co-author is, in fact, the even as Secretary of Defense, is probably serving to a certain extent, has been for the last 16 months, as Secretary of State on these issues. Uh, you know, Secretary Tillerson didn't have a background. I mean, certainly he was used to law and rules as head of ExxonMobil, but didn't really appreciate the value of international law. So there's no one really in the administration to stick up for international law. Um, the, uh, you know, in the Bush administration, uh, you know, in the first term, there was Colin Powell. Uh, in the second term, uh, we had both Secretary Rice and Bob Gates who were very linked up together. Uh, Secretary Rice really supported everything that I was doing as legal advisor. Um, Oh, on the case you and I were talking about, uh, oh, on oh, my recommendation to Secretary Rice and Secretary Rice's recommendation to the President, you know, the United States uh, uh, ordered all of the states, uh, Texas and others, to comply with the ruling of the International Court of Justice with respect to the Mexican National. That was an extraordinary step that the President took. I don't see, you know, the President Bush did that on the recommendation of his Secretary of State. You know, now, there's no one who would be that voice. You know, Secretary Pompeo, you know, at least right now, doesn't have that background. So it's really, you know, it's not going to come from the Attorney General, Attorney General Sessions. So it's really just going to be Secretary Mattis sticking up for international law, and then he's going to have to really pick and choose his battles. You know, we, we, he we gather he's you know, opposed withdrawal from Paris and opposed withdrawal from the Iran deal, but there's just sort of only so much you can do. So, um, so I am concerned about that, that we, uh, that there are, there are not voices to argue, um, even for just day-to-day -day compliance uh, with, you know, not even the controversial things like Paris or the Iran deal, but just everyday you know, when the president, I, I, I mentioned use of force policy, you know, is there someone really even explaining to the president and the vice president the rules on use of force? We do have rules. So the United States is sometimes accused of violating them, but, you know, you want the president and others at least to be aware of those. So I'm concerned about that. So back to your first point, I don't envy the, the current legal advisor. I think she's going to have a tough job, you know, and John Bolton in particular, uh, despite being a lawyer, you know, is, is, is at least historically had a hostile attitude towards uh, international law. He thinks that it's uh, uh, sort of used to, to uh, interfere with American sovereignty. Now, you know, will this have a long-term impact? I think some of what we're seeing over this number of years is going to have a long-term impact. Um, on the other hand, you know, what we have seen over time, although this is period is certainly out of the normal standard deviation, is, you know, the United States is able to sort of go back up and down and have these resets. Uh, and I would like to think that uh, I, uh, I don't see it moderating in the Trump administration. I just don't see that. Uh, uh, the, but I could see in a post-Trump era, you know, the United States does have this amazing resilience uh, and strong institutions to be able to, to, to 
return. So I, I, short term worried, longer term hopeful. I am going to give the last question to Caitlin Vito. Thank you very much, Corey. John, so nice to meet yeah. you. My name is Caitlin Vito, um, and I work with the Institute, and actually with Corey Jockey. <laughs> You're lucky you. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, I want to thank you, first of all, so much for this very informative discussion, and I'd like to circle back to your point about drones. Yeah. I uh, thought it was a very interesting point, and I was wondering if coming out of that, whether you see any potential legal challenges for the U.S., and the use of drones in, let's say, Pakistan or Somalia um, in the near future, as it has been stepping up with the Trump administration? Really good question. I, I, had, I had spent a lot of time on drone issues for a while, and maybe just there's so much noise going on on so many other things, there's been a little bit less. I, I was a little surprised back in the Obama administration that there were not more challenges. I actually wrote a op-ed in the Post very early on that uh, with the provocative title uh, called, Will Drone Strikes Become Obama's Guantanamo? And, uh, you know, because what I saw was the Obama administration having perhaps learned the lesson of Guantanamo saying, there are these bad people out there, but we have learned the lesson that picking them up and holding them as, does not work well for the United States. So we are just going to start dropping more drones on them. And as you know, uh, you know, five or six hundred drone strikes uh, during the Obama administration, and there was a surge of discontent, and there were some court cases, and it, uh, and President Obama, I think, did get concerned about that, and then uh, issued a number of these policies that began restricting his own use of drones. Part of my argument and other arguments to him was. You know, remember, just because the United States is doing this and thinks that, that there is a legal justification, you know, we're then opening up a Pandora's box for the rest of the world. And I used to say I would not have wanted to be the legal advisor when, you know, Russia uh, or some other country dropped a drone on Chechens or others and then quoted very cleverly from the American talking points. Um, so, uh, President Trump does seem to be ramping up drone strikes without a lot of transparency. Uh, uh, I think just so many groups are distracted with so many other things that we just haven't seen as much of this. Uh, uh, and the, you know, the question will be if as this ramp up continues or if it continues, uh, uh, will we uh, go back to seeing more criticism, possible court cases, uh, uh, cases even against U.S. officials, uh, uh, you know, in Pakistan or elsewhere. So, you know, hard to know. It's been sort of off the radar, so to speak. Uh, and I, I think it's, g given that, that there seems to be an increase in usage and apparently an increase in civilian casualties. The report that just came out. Right. Uh, the, yet you really hardly see any much criticism. I think it really just has to be that there is so much else to, that's controversial going on with the Trump administration that that has really fallen off the, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't even make it into the A section of the post anymore. So, uh, so anyway, I, worth looking at. I cannot resist the temptation to add one piece of good news <laughs> on, on international law and treaties, and that is that the United States Secretary General announced uh, last week that the first country likely to meet its Paris Climate Accords uh, I saw that. I Paris saw that. Climate Accords yeah. levels of restraint is going to be the United States of America. And that is because despite the hostility of the federal government, the great golden state of California, the city of New York, Chicago, Apple computers, um, are all going to hold ourselves accountable, even without uh, the federal government being willing to adopt the treaty. So on that note, my friends, won't you join me in celebrating the good and great time? <laughs>